Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 18, on evangelism, part 3. Hello, good morning, welcome. It's amazing how the flavor changes in here from a bunch of 18, 19 year olds to I don't, 25 year olds like yourselves. <laughs> About to sell you on something, that's why I'm buttering you up, so... I'm going to sell you on the Word of God, Luke 18, and we're back to where we've been the past two Sundays, which is this, look at this uh, hard look at uh, this guy that we call the rich young ruler and the, the situation, confrontation that he has between uh, a lost man and a Savior. Uh, it's so critical. We, we come up with our, our conclusions and our ideas about how things work and how th things come together, especially when it comes to evangelism, since the call of the church is to evangelize. Go and make disciples of all nations, right? That's our call. When we get an option on that, we don't get a vote on that. We get, to, we get told what to do because why? He's the king. Yeah, he's your friend, but first of all, he's the king. And don't start acting like he's your friend and not act like he's the king because he won't be happy with that. It's nice to have him as a friend, but it starts with being the king. He calls the shots. You're alive today because he decided that that's what he would do with you. Is that Okay. And he doesn't owe that to you. So when the king says this is what we do, when the king demonstrates this is what we do, then we need to listen to him. So Luke chapter 18, and we're going to uh, read our story again of the rich young ruler. So a certain ruler questioned him. Remember this, he's not the ruler in the political sense, he's a ruler in the theological sense. He's the chief of a synagogue. To be young, to be wealthy, and to be in that kind of position is, says a lot about him. And, and I don't have any reason to think that what he says about himself, that he's a good guy, that he is, because they've, basically they've voted him to a high position. But, but it, no matter how high you are, as far as we're concerned, comparatively speaking, you're not high enough to make, to make good for heaven. So that's, that's where his problem is. He knows that, but he doesn't want to listen to the Son of God, which is sad. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We talk about how garbled that question is. Either you inherit because you're in the bloodline, or there's nothing you can do. So that, that question is just, it's inadmissible in court, if you will. But Jesus doesn't hold him on the question as much as he holds him on the single word, good. Why do you call me good? Critical doctrine that follows. Critical. No one is good except God alone. This is why every person, apart from the intervention of God, through the saving work of Jesus, is not going to heaven. Again, no one who's not good will be in heaven. Your salvation cannot be earned because you've already lost your chance. Your chance of being good, the only chance you have of being good is not being born. <laughs> and oh well, somebody should have told you, right? But, mm. So this guy thinks, calls Jesus good, but understand he thinks he's good. That's his problem. Notice Jesus doesn't say, I'm the Savior. He doesn't say, pray this prayer. It's critical we understand this. He sends him right back to the Old Testament of all places because there wasn't another document available for the Bible. The Bible was the Old Testament. The Bible had been in existence for 400 years, complete at this point. It was, as we call it, the Old Testament. By the way, as you read the Old and New Testament, have you ever read the words Old and New Testament? Because <laughs> it ain't in there. That's our, we've decided that. All the way through, it's called one thing, the Word of God. Word of God, Word of God, Word of God, Word of God, Word of God. It doesn't change all the way through. Okay. So he sends it back to the Word of God, which we call the Old Testament, just for directions. Do not commit adultery, specifically the law. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. All these things, he says, I've kept from my youth. I'm a good person. I'm worthy of God to forgive me any, any of the few things that I've committed. That's his attitude. Jesus heard this and said to him, one thing you lack, so gentle with him, so kind with him, so different than the way he deals with the Pharisees who are always trying to trip him up. This guy is not in there for any ulterior motive, even though he doesn't know his own heart. He's best he can. He's asking uh, the right questions. And so Jesus deals kindly with him about the fact that he's an idolater and breaking the greatest commandment in the Bible. So he's breaking the greatest commandment in the Bible, but expecting to go to heaven. He's not going. He's not. He doesn't believe that. That's why Jesus sends him back to the law, because he hasn't learned what the law teaches. And Jesus kindly points this out. One thing you lack, sell your God, if you will, your possessions, distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. When he heard these things, he loved his God too much. He became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Again, in their theology, 
They, they thought those that were guaranteed to go to heaven were the rich, were the well-to-do, were the rulers of synagogues. These people were not in question in their culture and their theology. It's the rest of us that were, everybody else, that we're, we're not really sure if we're going. Those people are guaranteed to go. So he takes the top person and their understanding that they thought were going to heaven. He says, that one can't go. How hard it is. And he tells us how hard. Wow, what a bizarre picture. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That is so bizarre. There's another way to say impossible. And they heard it when they said, how can then, how can... Anybody be saved. Who can? Things that are impossible, that is, to save yourself or to save anyone else. What is impossible for men is possible with God. So we've left off there. We're going to continue there. And we, we're going to be, by way of review, this story is so critical because it's so important for us. It, 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 doesn't, it bears a lot of our time because we, have, we, we run off into directions and things that we're told to do. And then we invent the way we think it is. So Jesus says, go and evangelize, and we think we've got to invent what evangelism is. No. Jesus is the preacher. Jesus is the evangelist. Jesus is the missionary. You submit to him, and you submit to his ways. You don't come up with your own stuff. That's why we get into heresy and all kinds of weird stuff. This guy was in heresy. Jesus is directing him out of it. He'll direct us out of it if we'll listen. This story flips most of our understanding of evangelism over on his head. Most trashes a lot of our modern terms. And methodologies, uh, we've seen this. This man was the perfect seeker. Comes on his knees, it says, in another place. Comes asking the right question. But what more important question is there than how can I have eternal life? He asked the right person. He's, he's, he's not coming to Pastor Bill. He's coming to Jesus, the Son of God. So he's asking the right question, coming with the right attitude. Ask the, the, the right person and, and, and with no ulterior motives, he's not trying to trap Jesus, but he walks away. This is the most arresting thing about this. He walks away from this confrontation unsaved. How did Jesus mess that up? Any Baptist preacher would have had him joining this Sunday and baptized <laughs> next Sunday. And did, he's rich. Can't we make a way for this guy? I mean, we need him. We got budgets to meet and buildings to build and pastor salaries to pay. Can't we get him into the church? I mean, come on. How did Jesus mess this one up? Come on, Jesus. Go to our schools. Learn something, right? He walks away from the Son of God unsaved. Jesus doesn't do with him many things that we would have done. Number one, he doesn't tell him that he's the Savior. That is instructive. Why? You should be asking that question. We're going to answer that question, but why? Critical. There are some people that you cannot tell, right? That Jesus is the Savior. There are some people you can't tell, tell them that Jesus loves them and has a plan for their life. Don't tell them that. A person who's full of themselves and self-righteous, they believe that already. Of course God loves me. What's not to love? I'm going to make heaven so much better when I get there. No, they need to know that they're sinners in need of a Savior, which is something he didn't do. That's why Jesus sends them back to the law, which teaches them about sin. Sends it back. He's not ready to hear that story yet. Doesn't say pray this prayer. He doesn't say that. He doesn't follow him when he walks away. He doesn't do what we would, if we could have done, we would have done, which is perform a miracle. Because if you've been with us, miracles don't save people. They never have. They never will. They do not listen to Moses and the prophets. By the way, what part of the Bible is that? That's the Old Testament. If they will not listen to that document... They will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. That's the biggest miracle you can produce. That won't save anybody. It doesn't save them. Because those things don't save people. We learn the reason why. And the reason why is because lost people like this man are not just lost. They are also dead. They are dead. It's not the same as you're lost in the woods and we're looking for you and you're looking for us. It's not how it is. A lost person is lost spiritually. Physically, too, but, uh, man, that's a good ringer. That's really loud. <laughs> You're, you were dead. Notice, this is prior to Jesus. He's speaking to the Ephesian church, which are now saved. But prior to Jesus, you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So a lost person not only is dead, but the, the devil's standing on their grave. It's not the same as being lost in the woods. 
You're lost in the woods. I'm looking for you. You're looking for me. The louder I shout, the more helicopters we fly over, the better chance of you getting found. A lost person, you're looking for them, but they're not looking for you because they're dead. They're dead. They're not looking for you. Lost people don't seek for God. Scripture is very clear on that. They don't seek for God. They don't seek him because they are dead. They have to hear the words of God who created them or there will be no life in them. You cannot add to that. You can definitely subtract from it. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's the word of Christ. Faith is created in their hearts as the Spirit works the, the word of Christ in their lives. Not your method, not your presentation, not your wonderful music, even though I think we ought to have all that. Not your beautiful grounds, not your wonderful stained glass. These, not even your miracles, save no one. Never have, never will. The gospel, right, Paul says. I am not ashamed of the gospel. No confidence in his own preaching, no confidence in the ministry of the church as apart from the gospel. For it, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is. The gospel is. The word of Christ is. Not the preacher, not the church, not the ministry, not the music, not the messenger, not the presentation, or whatever vehicle gets that message to them. Stop placing your faith in those things. They're, uh, they're really, of, of, comparatively speaking, of little consequence to the Word of God and the gospel that comes through the Word of God, the good news that comes. We, we, we have to be corrected to this. Again, this is teaching is so critical. This, this, this confrontation that Jesus has is so critical. We saw that not only does Jesus not tell him that he's the Savior, but he also sends him back to the law. You cannot graduate to the new covenant to, 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 to knowing Jesus as Savior until you've passed the old covenant, which is conviction of sin 101. Have you passed that class? Which says you're a sinner and you're a Savior. You're a sinner who God, be, understand that a sinner is so guaranteed of hell, it, it's, God, it, it's based upon God's own, uh, 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 his, his reputation. If he doesn't send you to hell, it damages his reputation. His reputation rides on the fact that you're going to bust that place wide open. Do you understand that? See, until you've graduated from that course, which is what the Old Testament is, conviction of sin 101, you're not ready for a Savior. This guy wasn't ready to be told he was a Savior because he, he thought he was. He already got himself a Savior. I've got my money and I've got my reputation and I'm a ruler in a synagogue. And he just wants Jesus to give him, I don't know, a few tweaks on his, you know, his resume so that when he steps into glory, it'll be just that much better for him. Uh, he's not ready to hear that Jesus is a Savior. We saw this last time. Because the law only teaches one thing. He sends it back to the law because the law does one thing for us. It tells you you are caught. You're convicted. You're, you're awaiting ultimate sentence. You're already in jail. You're not going to go in jail. You're already there. If there had been a law which had given us, could have given us life, you could have been saved through the law. Truly, righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin. You convinced of that? I can't get out. I can't save myself, and no one can save me. See, not until then are you ready to hear the Savior. Not ready to hear the message of the Savior. That the promise, until then, that, that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. I understand that I'm under the, the sentence of my sin and that I'm headed to ultimate sentencing, eternal death. I understand that. I realize I need to be rescued. There you go. Now you're ready to hear the story of the Savior. But Jesus sends it back because he doesn't understand that. He's not learned what the tutor teaches him. For before faith, we were kept under the guard of the law, kept by faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor, bringing us to Christ. He's not set under the tutelage. Oh, he's memorized some verses, but they're not here. They're up here. He's listening to the theology of his world, which says, you're a good person. You're going to be fine. So, so the whole world says you're fine for the 70-something years of your life, and then you die and spend an eternity finding out that you're not. That's sad. Jesus is treating him kindly. He doesn't give him assurance of his salvation. He cuts the ground out from under him. Jesus sends him away because he's not, listen, interested in temporary converts. Those are easy to make. Pray this prayer. Pray this prayer, you're saved. Where does it ever say that in the Bible? I will save your time. It does not. It does not. Now, someone praying and accepting Christ, is that fine? That's totally fine. But there is no prayer, prayer of the sinner in the Bible. It's just simply not there. 
Until a person is cornered by their sin and their sin debt, they will really never turn to the Savior. And you say, yes, they will. And I say, no, they won't, because why? We have Jesus telling us this. He doesn't give them the good news or the new covenant because the guy's not ready. Learn. We have to learn. Learn. So until we graduated from the old covenant, we're not ready for the new covenant. Not only does Jesus not tell this man that he is the Savior, he sends him back to the old covenant, which is contradictory to a lot of our thinking today. There's a nasty rumor going around in our churches today. And it's, I don't know that it's a modern thought, but it's going around in modern times. And this nasty rumor very simply says that the Old Testament is no longer necessary for the New Testament church. Yeah. You heard that one? Yeah. It's common. In fact, in some of our bigger churches, and maybe even our Baptist churches, I have no idea. This is the only church I'm a part of, so I don't go anywhere. I don't talk to nobody. <laughs> really, I don't. I talk to my wife. She tells me if I'm wrong, and I listen. <laughs> that position that the Old Testament is no longer necessary for the New Testament church is not just a little off. It's rank heresy. Again, it is rank heresy heresy. Either A, this person doesn't know enough of Bible and is just shooting from the hip and they need to shut their mouths, if I might say that, because we who teach are going to be held under a stricter judgment. So be careful if you plan to teach that you're teaching it correctly. And if you don't think you got it right, well, then don't open your mouth. But he's a little overconfident. Or on the other hand, he's really up to something bad, which is very similar to the devil who knows plenty of Bible enough to twist it and I would say, if, we, if that is true, then this is the next step for that doctrine. The next step is not to just cancel out the Old Testament, also cancel out the New Testament and say, listen to me. That's the pattern. We've, we've had a pattern for 2,000 years of all kinds of false teaching rolling through our churches and people leading people off into heresy and all kinds of things. But I would say, if, if, if that heresy is your thinking, you're, you've got a big problem, not the least of which the New Testament writers and the king of the New Testament, Jesus, disagrees with you that the Old Testament is not necessary for the New Testament church. I say that because, because we have so, such prolific evidence to the contrary of that thought. Here's one of them. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Where is the Word of Christ? So you see, Pastor, that's talking about the New Testament. Really? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? Pay careful attention. So, so Paul is writing that in one book. What book was that book? Romans? So it's impossible that he was referring to the book of Romans because he was writing the book of Romans. Right? right. Think. Just, we got to think here. Also, I would say to you, if you know when the history of this was, almost certainly he was not referring to any other book in the New Testament because they also had not been written or for sure were not being circulated. So when he says the word of Christ, what is he talking about? The only word that was available that day, by that, uh, that time, and it had been available for 400 years, the Old Testament. Not the New Testament. I'm not trying to undercut the New Testament. I'm just trying to make a point about the guys who say we don't need the Old Testament. Because here it says, I can, come to, I can come to faith in Christ by reading the Old Testament. In fact, there are all the words of Christ. You say, well, I don't know if that's the word of Christ or not. Well, I would, I would say you've got another problem then. So if it could be true if the words of Christ, let's just say, as for sake of argument, the words of Christ are only in the New Testament. That's some, some people think that. But if that is true, then then you're telling me that Jesus isn't God. And if Jesus isn't God, we've got a whole different problem because the Old Testament was the Word of God. In fact, here's, here's what the Old Testament tells us about God himself. I, only I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. But you're going to call Jesus Savior, but you're not believing that he's God? You've got a problem. Because if Jesus isn't Savior, Jesus isn't God, then he can't save you, Right? And if he can't save you, then we're all dying in our sins and going to hell even though we think we're not. And we got bigger problems than Old Testament, New Testament. Like I said, those de designations are not in the Scriptures anyway. So, so it, it, Jesus only speaks in the New Testament. So, so, but God is only the Savior. So here we have the New Testament. Talk about mess with your head if you don't have it on right. According to the commandment of God, Paul is introducing himself, writing this letter to Titus, his protege, left him down in Crete because he had to do some work down there. And he says about his ministry, I'm doing the ministry that God called me to according to the commandment of God our Savior. Emphasis, obviously mine. To Titus, my true son. This is the first two, three, four verses in the scriptures. To Titus, my true son, in, the, in a common faith, grace and peace from God, our fa uh, God the Father in Christ Jesus, our Savior. 
So God the Savior, Jesus the Savior, but only God is the Savior. So either this is a contradiction or Jesus is God. Not just here. You've got a ton of places in the New Testament that says the same thing in the same way. Jesus is God. In fact, if he's not God, then he can't save you. Only God can save. Only God can save. Only man could die. That's why God became a man. But only God can save you. Only God, man can die, but only God can save Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, became God to die and take your place. It's the transitive law. So if A equals B and B equals C, then C equals A. Jesus is God. So follow the reasoning. Since Jesus is God, then the original part of the Word of God, the Old Testament, is also Jesus' words. It also is. To say that it isn't and to direct people away from it, again, like I said, is rank heresy. It is rank heresy. Back to, back to our verse here. So, so let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Romans 10, 17, the faith. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. What, what, what book is he talking about in the New Testament? None. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. Here, here's another place. Wow, what, what, what searching this should cause for us, I, I think. So it's critical doctrine. We know these doctrines if you've been in church very much at all. Paul says to the Corinthian church who he started, who he witnessed to, who he saved, got saved underneath his ministry, who he baptized, who he ordained the elders in this church. He knows who he's talking to. He knows what he did there. He laid a foundation, a beautiful one. For I handed down to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Which Scriptures? And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. It's impossible he's referring to the book of 1 Corinthians since he was writing it. Almost certainly not referring to any book in the New Testament since they were not either written or circulating by this time. He is referring to the only Scriptures that existed at that point, which were the Old Testament. Can you, a New Testament believer from the Old Testament, preach the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Because they could in the New Testament. They very much could. It was their authoritative document, and it has not ceased to be that at all. But here, let's, let's get to another one. And we only have 17 or 18 more of those examples to give to you, and then you'll be able to go, you know, maybe... <laughs> Maybe in a couple hours. Here, look, look here, Paul, Paul, Paul writing to Timothy, his protege, right? Hey, he, he tells him and encourages him in ministry and be faithful and to preach the word. And notice what the word is. The childhood, from childhood, he says, you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. What, what book is he referring to? For, not Second Timothy. He's writing that book. He's talking about the sacred documents. He's talking about the Old Testament. Which, by the way, colors this one, doesn't it? Next verses. All Scripture. What Scripture? Again, by the will of God and by the oversight of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament. Don't, don't, don't hear me. I'm not trying to undercut the New Testament anyway. It's 100% the Word of God, 100% reliable, and God breathed, which is actually the Hebrew here, or the Greek here. All Scripture is inspired by God. But as Paul writes this, and as Timothy hears this, they don't have in mind any other book except for the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you know. All Scripture is inspired by God, beneficial for teaching, rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or woman of God may be fully capable and equipped for every good work. The person that's telling you don't need the Old Testament is cutting that out of your life. Again, it, it is... Not just a little off, it's rank heresy. To say that the Old Testament is not applicable for the New Testament church. That is heresy. Don't, don't be a heretic. Back to the Old Covenant. So Jesus sends him back to the Bible, which of course was the only testament at that time because he hadn't learned the teachings from it. He not graduated from the Old Covenant. So the New Covenant information he couldn't receive. Jesus is the Savior. He's not ready for that because he doesn't think he's a sinner. So he sends him back to the law, sends him back to the, to the rules. Again, rank heresy to say the Old Testament and the Old Covenant is not necessary because the New Test for the New Testament church because the Savior of the New Testament church is sending this man and his evangelism experience back to the Old Testament. Again, we don't get to create what we think evangelism is. We follow what the Scriptures teach us. And there are cases in which, I would suggest to you most cases, 
That person needs to go back to the law. They need to know that they're a sinner. They'll never think they need a Savior until then. How, how can they accept the cure that you have for them, that God has for them, until they think they're sick? Here's another, ooh, powerful one. So not only is the Scriptures the Word of God and the Word of Christ, it's also the sword of the Spirit, right? For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, even to penetrating as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it does heart surgery. This guy is getting sent back to heart surgery. But specifically, again, as the writer of Hebrews is writing, he's a Jew, writing to Jews. What books is he talking about? Our books? The Old Testament. You take away, you, you, you're, you're taking away the work of God. Again, I have a lot of questions. For, in fact, I wouldn't want to be them. And they're talking about the Old Testament doesn't belong to the New Testament church. I wouldn't want to be that person. They're in danger. Again, why are people not converted by any other means? If they will not hear the voice of God in the Old Covenant, there is not a, there's not a presentation or a publication or a preacher or a, anything that's going to get through to them because if, they, if the heart surgery hasn't got them to the place where they're ready to hear about the Savior, nothing will. Nothing will. You add nothing to that. It's not the, it's the sword of the Spirit, right? It's not the sword of the church. It's not the sword of the Baptist. It's not the sword of the method or the ministry, whatever that may be. It is not sharp because of our fluff. How do we fluff it? By our beautiful grounds, by our beautiful music, by our beautiful preachers. Everybody say amen. amen. <laughs> it doesn't get any sharper because of our fluff. We should have, I don't know about beautiful preachers, but everything else. We should have everything. We should be the best at what we could possibly be. But don't put your faith in that stuff. It is only the word of God that changes. It's only this heart surgery. It's sharp because it's the word of God. Jesus sends this man back to heart surgery. Because until the heart surgery has, until the law has pierced his heart, he's not ready to hear the new covenant, the new story, the gospel. He is not ready. How do we know that? Because this is Jesus. He tells us how evangelism works. He tells us how to reach people. He's the leader. He's the missionary, right? He's the evangelist. We're, we're the tools of his hands at the best. This is the reason why the Bible is written bad news and then good news. Because until you've heard the bad news and accepted it, you're not ready for the good news. The bad news that God will throw a, has, has to throw a person like you into hell. Or else he damages his own reputation. He becomes, he becomes part and parcel. He becomes an aid and a better to your crimes. He's not going to do that. Your, your eternal crimes, God's going to become a part of that? No. Somebody's going to pay for those crimes. Either Jesus does or you do. That's the way the judgment is going to work. So any person that doesn't accept what Jesus has, guess what? They get to pay for it themselves. Eternal crime, eternal punishment, eternally fitting to be sure. Jesus, again, as per our example, some people aren't ready for the new covenant because they haven't been worked on by the old. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you have given us your word, and we have to be so careful with it. God, we thank you that you lead us out of darkness into light. We are sheep, and we're thankful, God, that ultimately we will hear your voice and we will follow you, but there are so many distracting and deceiving voices that are out there. Help us to hear what your word has to say. Help us to, to correctly divide it, to do the work uh, that it takes, to roll up our sleeves, to hear, uh, to dig. Uh, to, to come to you, Lord, you're, you're the one. It's your spirit that ultimately is the teacher for us, Lord. We know that we have great gifts that you've given to the church, and Lord, help us to submit to those gifts, but help us ultimately to sit down and say, God, what, what is it that you're saying to me? What is it that I need to know? Thank you, God, that your word is the way you communicate to us. So we're opening our hearts to it right now. Thank you for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.